Welcome everyone to 17 Minutes of Science. My name is Sarah Cheeseman, and I am your host today. It's nice to be back as we wind down summer. I'm really delighted about our guest today, who is Dr. Anna Scope, who is joining us from Madison, Wisconsin, where she tells me it's been a very wet summer in contrast to us in the West, which has been very dry. So Anna is a professor in the Department of Genetics and an affiliate faculty member in life science communication and the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arts Institute at University of Wisconsin-Madison. So she mentors both scientists and art students in her lab, which is what we're gonna talk about today. And she serves on the board of the Wisconsin Science Museum. Where many of her art science collaborations are on display. And the focus of Anna's lab is understanding the molecular mechanisms that underlie asymmetric cell division. She does um, mammalian model uh, cell culture as her model system, but she has a back background in C. elegans, which is likely how we became friends on this show. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anna to say hello, and then we're gonna dive into science, C. elegans, and art. All right, uh, greetings everyone from Madison. I'm excited to be here and thanks for coming. Well, we're delighted to have you. And we're also excited to learn more about uh, what's behind you, the backdrop. I know we're going to talk about it. Uh, I urge everybody to check out Anna's um, website when we're done here. We'll post that on the, the links because there's a lot to see. She's a very busy woman and we only just touched the surface, but we will get started by saying or talking about how you grew up surrounded by the arts. And can you tell us a bit more about your childhood and how that influenced the ways you work with art now in your professional life and otherwise? Yeah, I grew up in, um, and basically an art students, my parents were uh, both artists. Uh, my dad was a sculptor and art professor. My mom was a ceramist and high school art teacher. Um, and all of my, I'm the oldest of four and my brothers and sisters, are all graphic and my brother's an industrial designer and they're all kind of marketing gurus. And so art, as we found out, is used in every business around the world. That's very important. And my family, my brothers and sisters make a lot more money than I do as a scientist. So art is more important than you think. And there's a lot of money in art if you're very good at it. And so my family are, are extremely talented um, people. And um, you would assume that being a scientist, I'm the black sheep in the family, but in, in fact, I'm not. I'm still an artist, and so I have, I got a ceramics minor um, as an undergrad. I'm actually currently doing it now with my lab on the side, so we do it every Thursday night, so that's been kind of fun. Um, but it's been, it's been part of my life. There's no difference between it. I'm never in and outside of it. It's just part of who I am, and the art side of my life allows me to see things differently than others. And that's kind of where the magic happens and discoveries are made. It's your perspective, your background and your upbringing. You bring to science these qualities that allow you to see things and observe things in different ways and also to communicate them in different ways. And so, yeah, that's sort of my upbringing um, in a family of artists. I went. Uh, as my undergrad, but I got my PhD and got away from art in a little way, but I always was doing hobbies in the arts all the time. I make jewelry, I make cakes that look like scientific things, I draw them, you know, so any place that I can, they, I can utilize that side of communicating science in, in that way, it's just, that's part of who I am. Mm, that's awesome. So you said that you have an undergraduate degree in the arts, but then graduate school took you towards the STEM fields and biology. Yeah. What pulled you to that direction at that point in your life? Well, when I was an undergrad, I probably my favorite course was developmental biology. I, I started looking at this developmental biology book and I, I'd never seen embryos before from different animals. And I was stunned by the beauty of embryos in general and how diverse they were, but yet similar at the same time. But the beauty of a structure um, that's near and dear to many people's hearts is uh, microtubules and actin. So the cytoskeleton is very beautiful structures. And so when I first saw the first confocal image of the C. elegans embryo, which turned out to be my future mentor, a PhD mentor, I actually circled that picture. And I realized later on in life, it reminded me of a Moreau painting. And I love Moreau. And it looked exactly like the centrosomes and spindles of the cell. And so I think for me as an undergraduate, 
that view of that course realizes like, wow, there, I can still do art and be a scientist because there's actually, there's so much beauty in biology. And I had no idea that you could discover pieces of artwork in your own body. And I think that's the cool part of science is that it, it kind of surprised me. And I think that course really sealed the deal. I was like, okay, I think I want to do this. I don't know anything about it. And my, you know, my family didn't have experience except they love biology. Love, most of my family really love biology. My mom actually used to make jewelry out of things she used to dissect. And so there was this, always this kind of mashup in our family between science and art. But yeah, I mean, really the fact that I can discover pieces of artwork in my body and different human cells is, is kind of an awesome job, right? So yeah, definitely love it. That's a great way to sum that up. I had a similar experience in my developmental biology course as an undergraduate. That was the thing that suddenly made me realize how amazing biology really was in an applied sense and the beauty of it. Yeah. yeah I mean, you. Take pictures like that. It's just incredible, yeah. <laughs> especially the worms. I mean, the, that I can just visualize that image you're describing. Yeah. Um, so what the worm embryo is so beautiful for. So I guess that, that ties into an, uh, another question that we can talk about, which is that art and science traditionally are thought of as, as sort of separate subjects, but everything you just said uh, goes against that and bringing, bringing those concepts together and that um, they imp impact one another. So. Tell us more along the lines of what you just started to say about what you see as the biggest benefit of bringing those two fields together in your work. I, I think for me, the biggest, I mean, they're beneficial. They're there whether you like it or not, but the critical thing is that people forget about is communication. So from the dawn of time in science and art have always been communicating to everyone else what you're seeing right and so communication makes science accessible to everyone and I think we often think of science as expensive and inaccessible because you need all of this stuff but in reality if you can draw and write and observe smell taste touch feel all of these things that artists are in tune with as well you can actually be a scientist why because you can communicate what you're seeing what you're seeing in nature um, and what you uh, see in your data analysis and how you view things. And so it is both of those are really important to understand the world around us. Like art, artists and scientists do these things, right? We have to interpret the data. We have to communicate the data in a simple way. And you need a sensibility of, of art and aesthetics to do that. And I think for me, the greatest, like as Einstein said, the greatest scientists are always artists as well. And it's very true that they're really excellent communicators, both visually and verbally and orally, right? Mm -hmm. And both of these, both of these fields require creative and critical thinking about problem solving. Um, and so I, you know, I, that, to me, it's, there's no separation. And I think for me, um, school always was a struggle because they were separated, but reality, they're really this, you know, they're doing the same and they always feel like, oh, you're going to make a lot of money if you be a scientist or a medical doctor, vice versa. But the, the art is always there and they've been separated out as different fields, but they're critical for each other. And I think we, we're not two dimensional beings as scientists. We're not robots that do that. We're thinkers and dynamic people that think about things and problem solve in different ways. And I think that's where having um, a hobby or a career or paths in art or using it all the time is really important because it allows you to see things in different ways. And, and that's certainly where magic happens um, is because you saw something that someone else didn't see and you, you formed a hypothesis and you went after it and then you communicated what you found to people. And that's the fun of science. And that's the fun of also art. You discovered a beautiful thing and you would like to paint it and you would like to share it with someone else, mm -hmm. right? Those kinds of things, same kind of thing. So um, yeah, I, I think that our education system has compartmentalized our thinking here. And it's for me growing up in the household of artists, I struggled through school because I had to do that, but I found my way and I realized I didn't have to separate myself. It's impossible to separate myself. I have to just be myself. Mm -hmm. And I think when I talk to students and try to understand that, you know, if you have a, a pencil or you can touch and feel and observe things, you're a scientist, you know, you're discovering the world. And I think that's what 
the piece there that you know, I think is the biggest benefit in understanding. And certainly some scientists are not good communicators and artists, are, some people aren't either, right? So they're, they're, it goes both ways, you know, it, it, there is some skill and creativity and thought and perspective. And your background is also equally important of how you view and traverse your own, you know, life and world in science and art. Well, I, I think we're all on board with the idea of diversity of opinions and views helps us move forward and seeing things differently. Yeah. Uh, and that and that benefits everybody. So yeah. I love that. So tell us more about you have organized and curated the biennial worm art show at the uh, International Worm Meeting. Tell us, tell us about that and, and, and what that's like. So I started that as a third year grad student. I saw I started going to science meetings and I also was working on the microscope. And I went to the science meeting. I was like, why aren't scientists sharing the things that they're seeing? You know, things that not necessarily wouldn't go into journal articles, but they're actually the beautiful things that might just get saved for your own personal use. And so I asked my mentor who was organizing the meeting at that time, could I do this art show? Because my family had, we, we curated art shows. My brothers and sisters and I would, would sit in, and serve drinks at the bar at openings at art shows. I was used to doing this. And so I my mentor says, you can do anything you want, but don't involve me. And so, and so I said, all right. And so I, this was, you know, this was before the internet was just starting. So it was hard to get information out, but we put a, you know, we put a request in for the art show and to my amazement, the first art show, we got um, glass blowers that were sandblasting the genome onto vases. We had people doing um, mobiles of the larval stages of C. elegans in driftwood, you know, they, they were finding things in their normal life. And then my own mentor, John White, entered um, the a wooden model he had made of a reconstructed vulva from the C. elegans. And that was like, he's like, oh, I had this in my closet and I thought I'd enter it. And so that was like, even though he said he didn't want to involve me, it was kind of like this cool thing. Is he, he built that so that him and the rest of the team at that time working on that project could see what they were talking about in three dimensions. And I, that's where the discoveries were made. And so that was kind of cool to see it. You know, John White, who mapped the entire nervous system of an organism, was building a wooden uh, cell by cell drawing of this vulva reconstruction. So that was kind of cool. So I realized he supported me in my own way and really loved it. And he, the other thing that John and I had in common is he also, I'm dyslexic. And so he also said he was too. And I was surprised at that time is, is that he had a keen interest in the arts as too. I think we were both visual, we were kind of these visual uh, learners and thinkers about how we do things, but we may have not been perfect at school, but it's the way we saw the world was in similar ways. And so he gave me the confidence to continue doing this art show. And, you know, it's been running for 26 years, you know, and it's very popular and, you know, certainly lots of companies love it because um, we get a lot of it was probably the most popular thing at the meeting. Again, this year we crashed, I think, Zoom because so many people wanted to see the winner. And so that was kind of awesome. Um, but what it really is, is people want to see real people in science and they see each other doing these creative outlets. It's kind of like we're starved for re like reality, like in science, because we feel like we have to water down our life and we don't. We're real people and we have different interests. And some people do needlework and some people do ceramics and some people paint and it's just so cool and refreshing to see that when you see it at a meeting and so I think that's why people really like it is because we see each other as ourselves we're not you know this a robot scientist right we are really cool interesting people and from that art show came the reality is that I belong in science. Like I realized, oh, well, look at all these creative people. I'm also creative. And so that's kind of cool. So I didn't recognize when I was younger how creative the sciences were until I started to do that. And so I, it kind of, it's kept me in science for sure, the art show, because I realized that I'm just not alone. You know, mm -hmm. I make you feel like you're alone, but you're not. So I assume that's why it's continuing. And Certainly it's launched a lot of other people's careers and, and, and side hustles on Etsy. And so Etsy kind of 
came into that. And so now every people has access to sell their own science art. I mean, it's certainly a whole new genre of stuff that people are really interested in buying. Why? Because they're interested in the world around them and the beauty of science. Yes. And sometimes the wonderful esoteric nature of having a piece of art like that and then finding someone else who understands what it means, uh, right. you know, at the core, what, whether they have a background or not. Right. What you're saying about crashing the Zoom at the conference makes me think of the popularity of the dance your PhD yeah. annual competition, um, that there's clearly such a an outlet for that too, right? How to express what we're interested in in different ways. I've always thought that is so clever and funny and I always want to see it. <laughs> it's kind of like we should, every science conference should have a talent show because we are all really talented other ways because yep. we want to see each other as our own unique people in a different way. We want to see each other as real because we are real, you know, but we don't <laughs> often share the real sides of each other. And I think it's just an outlet for that. So. I'm grateful to be able to provide an outlet for up and coming science artists to realize they're not alone either, but there's a lot of cool people out there that are doing amazing things. So. Yeah, well, I'm sure it'll carry on based on that momentum. That's an amazing legacy that you've created. In our last minute, because can you believe it, where there we are, tell us about Genetic Reflections, your backdrop, the coloring book, and that project. So this project is the dissemination coloring book of a big 40 foot science art piece that's installed here in Madison. We also have a traveling piece. My two undergraduates, um, uh, Elif uh, Kurt and Caitlin Marks helped me put together um, this coloring book to disseminate um, this glass piece. And we thought, we thought we would do it because it's very accessible and it's the first coloring book of its kind for model organisms and sort of DNA together at this kind of uh, student level. There's certainly, there's been coloring books on genetics, but this is very specific for model organisms. And we certainly didn't see that out there, but it communicates a lot of the imagery that is in the science art piece that we have here installed. And if you go to our website, you can see videos and, and images of uh, genetic reflections. And the reflections piece, which is not kind of, it's hard to do in the coloring book, but there's a mirror and then a sandblasted genome of glass. And then you look into it and you reflect the genome inside of you. So you're in there. So that's what the genetic reflection actually means. Okay. And so it's a very interactive piece. And so when you go to see the videos online and you can kind of see what it looks like, the goal there was to try to get the young student or the public to realize that the genome and these base pairs are inside of them, right? And there's beauty to it. And there's also complexity and simplicity at the same time. And that's what geneticists are doing. And so the piece walks through um, all these model organisms that are related to each other um, and including humans. And so we, the same gene is found in all these different species and this is in this piece. And so this is what the genetics reflection piece is. And Angela Johnson was my artist, my first MFA, MFA student to help me with this project that we got an NSF grant on, thankfully, um, to do this. And then the, the coloring book came from that. My two undergrads, all of, most of, almost everyone in my lab has, um, science and art majors. So my undergrads all have this interest in the arts as well. They're drawn to me for that reason. And I proposed this idea and they worked as part of their life science communication internship in the lab to do this coloring book. Wow, so, that is very cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And so they're very talented students. And, um, you know, as you can see, it's a very beautiful backdrop. And both Alif and Caitlin are very talented science artists. And Alif wants to be a medical doctor. And uh, Caitlin would like to work for the WHO or the CDC. And so that there, what is required for that? Well, you need to communicate both to the patient and to the public about um, health. And so this project really allowed them to see that communication visually and verbally, these ways are really important. So mm. yeah, it's a, great, a great story. Yeah. Well, I can tell our, our viewers that it's available on Amazon if you want to go check it out. Um, it looks like a beautiful book. I am thinking I should get a copy for my children. So I can't believe we did it already. It's our time is up. We covered a lot, but there's always another 
sometimes people tell me after the fact, oh, I wish it was 17 more minutes because we have so much more to talk about. But we we touched on some great topics that we don't normally spend time thinking about together here. So we appreciate you sharing your story uh, and bringing this perspective to us and to, to the people who, who follow us here on 17 Minutes of Science. All right. Thank you so much. Well, well, we'll stay tuned. We'll be watching what you're up to. And we will also post some links to all of uh, Anna's work and her websites, which are beautiful. And I encourage everybody to go there. So thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you next time.